This is learning outcome three, which is understanding how meaning is created in products. So according to the specification, you need to be able to explain the use and application of production techniques to create media products, and you need to critically analyze the codes and conventions of media texts and how they contribute to wider ideas and meaning. So basically, you've got to be able to explain real examples of different production techniques and why they've been used, and you need to know the different theories and be able to apply them to real life products. So let's take a start by looking at the production techniques first. So there's different types of production techniques and the usual reason is to create some sort of code and convention. So a convention is the common way of doing things and products. For example, credits at the end of movies. A code is a familiar and predictable technique used in a product to convey ideas and create meaning. There's two types of codes and conventions. You can have a technical or symbolic. Technical is when it's used through some sort of equipment like camera angles, lighting and music. And symbolic is when the meaning is created through an impression. So usually some sort of connotation or a less obvious technique. The word genre is very closely linked to codes and conventions because I think that products that fall into a particular type of genre are to do with the codes and conventions that you see in those products. So genre is the type or theme of a product. For example, an action, adventure, rock or pop, different types of genre that you can have. So by categorizing these products, people will have a certain expectation. So they will see or expect to see certain conventions for example, in a horror film, you will expect to be scared. You will usually even go and watch the film in the first place because that's what you expect and that's what you want to see. So a code and convention can allow a film to fall into a certain genre. Often, the things that allow a genre to be kind of dictated and codes and conventions to be met are something called mise-en-scene elements. Now, mise-en-scene basically means everything you see on the screen. So elements, examples of them that you would expect to find as mise-en-scene elements are location, iconography, props, costumes, camera work, sound, lighting, and color design. And each of those will be used for, to make some sort of effect on the audience when they're watching it. So the location is obviously very important. It can help to show the time period and the area in which people are living. Iconography is when you use some sort of symbolic codes. You've got props, which are objects that are held or used to further the plot. Costumes are obviously very important because it can dictate what time line you're using and the kind of area or characters that they are. You can also have loads of stereotypes that are dictated by props and costumes. For example, short skirts on a girl means that they're promiscuous. Um, smart suits means that they're some sort of authority figure, that kind of stuff. Now, one of the effects that you might want to achieve with the audience was something that you might want to get is verisimilitude. Now, verisimilitude is when something is believable. So how real or believable something is. So to achieve verisimilitude, you need to think carefully about the mise-en-scene elements. How can you make something look um, professional, but also realistic and believable? So if you think about costumes, locations, all that kind of stuff, you can make something look believable and real. Another method that you could use for a mise-en-scene element and to try and make something believable is to use sound. So diegetic sound is all sound that is in the scene. So in other words, what is actually currently in that actual scene. So it's not something that you've added in afterwards. It's what was originally there when you press record and had a microphone. So usually this will be the dialogue, any sound effects that are occurring during the scene. Any in-world music, for example, if the radio was playing during the scene, 
and any off-screen sound, so anything that's going on in the background of that scene. You can also have non-diegetic sound, which is sound that is added in afterwards. It's added in separately. The characters during that actual scene, they can't hear that sound. So this covers things like narration, where you do a voiceover, the soundtrack, so any like added music, incidental music, and sound motifs. A sound motif is kind of a little jingle that you might hear, so like a theme tune or some sort of music that's played for one particular purpose. So the best example of that is like a little James Bond tune that comes up when he's on screen or when he does something that's James Bond-esque. So there's a few different sound editing techniques as well that you could use. For example, dubbing is the term used to add extra sound to the original recording. Noise print is when you remove any unwanted noise in a scene. And a sonic bridge is where the sound carries over a visual transition. So the best example we used for this was in Saving Private Ryan, where the camera goes nice and close into his eyes to show his emotion. And you can hear the waves crashing on the beach. And the very next scene is that scene with the waves crashing on the beach. And it uses the sound to bridge the two scenes together. So there are some things that you can do with the camera that will really help to add some sort of emphasis, some sort of emotion or effect on the audience. So the camera shots or the camera angles, the way in which a scene is filmed helps determine who the characters are. It can help you determine the storyline and what contributes to verisimilitude. So in other words, the realism that you can get from the camera angles. So rather than go through every single camera angle and show all sorts of different examples for the purpose of this exam you just need to think about specific camera angles and how they could have been used so what we've done is looked at saving private ryan we've looked at um, silence of the lambs all sorts of different examples and then we've obviously done grown-ups halloween all kind of different things like that but what you need to think about or what I personally would do, is just think about the close-up shot. So the close-up shot, or even the extreme close-up shot, is zooming right into the face or into their eyes. And the main reason for this is usually to show some sort of emotion on a character's face. In this particular case with uh, the Hannibal Lecter picture from say, uh, Silence of the Lambs, this is used to show like kind of how menacing and evil looking he looks in the face. So the whole of learning outcome three is basically tr uh, kind of aimed towards the 12 mark question. Sometimes you get an additional question as well, which is actually quite useful. Now, the, the whole purpose of this section is to try and show you how to answer the 12 markers and what kind of things you need to know. So this example 12 mark question is asking you to analyse how production techniques have been used to create meaning. This is a really easy question and you'd be really glad to get something like this because what you've got to do is basically talk about a couple of different production techniques and apply it to a, an actual product that you've studied. So even just using that Saving Private Ryan um, example that we've talked about and the Silence of the Lambs one just before, you could even talk about the close-up camera angle. So that's a production technique, that's something that's taken place during the production process. And they've planned that out. They've planned out to have the close-up of his eyes to show the kind of evil and the kind of pure evilness of his face. So when you look at it, you are kind of supposed to be intimidated and scared by what you're seeing on the screen. So you could talk about close-up camera angle, silence of the lambs, what the effect on the audience is, and then you move on to the next example. And that's what you're basically supposed to do. Now for all 12 mark questions, we need to apply some theories. You've got to put some theories in. So it's why, why, what would be the purpose of this? Why have they actually bothered to do it in the first place? So by the end of this video, that should all be really simple for you to, to understand. This is a little overview of all of the possible questions that, that have taken place so far on every exam paper. I'm pretty sure I've included all of them. There might be one missing. So that's all different 12 mark questions and you can see that there's a little bit of a pattern that builds up. What you 100% have to do is include what they call media theories to back up what you're saying. 
Some people find it difficult to understand what the question's asking and not entirely sure which approach to take. So my advice would be, the only question out of this whole list that I think was difficult is the second one down. The rest, all you've got to do is pick out the key words in the question. So for example, the first one, analyse how the concept of narrative. So we're going to learn all about the narrative theory in a minute. You need to know the concept of narrative and how do you apply it to a media product that you have studied. So in lessons, we'll have studied one particular product and applied the concept of narrative to it. There's two different narrative theories, so you could talk about the two different narrative theories and you put all the examples in from what you've studied. That one's quite easy. Carry on doing the same thing for the others. So analyse how genre conventions, so you think right, that's about genre and a media product you've studied. So we've studied one particular film for genre and you just go through like that, picking out the keywords. The only one I thought that was fairly difficult is the second one. Genre of a product does not contribute to, to his success. So we'll look at that a little bit later. So there's three different categories of theories that we need to understand. You've got representation, narrative theory, and genre theory. So representation is how different groups of people are basically portrayed in the media product. Narrative theory is the way in which the stories are told. And genre theory is basically linking it to the conventions that put something into a particular category. So the six theories that we've studied in the lesson are two genre theories, Rick Altman, Audience Pleasures, Steve Neal, Repetition and Difference, Narrative Theories, where Claude Levi Strauss for Binary Opposition, Shvetan Todorov, 1969 Five Step Narrative, Representation was Laura Mulvey, Objectification of Women, and Walter Lippmann, Stereotypes in the Media. You need to know all six of those theories, what they actually said, and a basic understanding of each one. Then what you can do is link each little category to a particular product. So we've done Halloween for genre, narrative, I did Die Hard in lessons, and representation, we did Grown Ups. So let's start by looking at the genre theories. They are basically looking at what makes a film fall into a certain category? What are the elements that pop into it that let it fall into a particular category? And that what the genre theory does is discuss why the audience and institutions use and recognise these particular genres. So the first kind of theory to think about is Rick Altman audience pleasures theory. And what he basically did was he argued that media products from a particular genre offers audience a different set of pleasures. So his three categories were emotional, visceral and intellectual pleasures. And he's basically saying that people choose to watch any of the different things for those reasons. So a media product will always fall into those three categories is what he's saying. So people will watch a certain film and they'll feel happy, sad or nostalgic. They'll watch a visceral pleasure film and they'll feel either excited, scared or they'll feel like laughing. And they could watch an intellectual pleasure film and it'll make them think. So that was his three particular things. And what you need to do is know that theory and also be able to apply it directly to a product. So how can we link the audience pleasures theory? Basically suggesting that most texts have a specific set of codes and conventions. So what's the intended effect of a horror movie? What are the conventions? I would say that the intended effect of a horror film is to feel a visceral pleasure, to either be scared or excited. What's the conventions? In horror films, they tend to have dark lighting, eerie music, props such as sharp knives and other kind of dangerous weapons. You might also have a lot of screams going on and you might have particular type of characters, so people that are almost certainly going to be killed in the movie. So the second theory that we could talk about is Steve Neal, Repetition and Difference. 
Now he basically declares that genres are all instances of repetition and difference. In other words, films from the same genre will have many similarities or repetition. However, they must contain something different to be interested to the audience. So media texts often in exhibit the conventions of more than one genre. And this falls into the sub-genre category. This is where the differences lie. So the best example I could think of would be what makes a horror film a horror film. You could think about, right, they've got lots of repetition in, as we discussed before, dark lighting, scary music, particular types of characters, certain props. But if every single one is the same, then people will be bored. So they need to do something that varies it up a little bit. One of the things that I've seen is a film called The Quiet Place. And basically what you what you're looking to look for in that film is that it's scary. You want that visceral gut pleasure. But it has a lot of repetition in. It's got a lot of dark scenes. It's got a lot of kind of mystery and stuff like that going on. It's got some blood and some gore, which is what you'd expect to see in a horror film. But the difference in this one is that there's no real sound in it. Most of the film is almost silent because if they make any sound, then they'll be, they'll be found by these monsters or aliens, whatever they are. So that could be the difference in that film. And it puts it into a sub-genre. It creates what you call a sub-genre because it's not just a standard horror. It would be more like a horror thriller because it's, it's suspenseful. So what we've looked at so far is genre. This is a question about genre conventions. So analyze how genre conventions have been used to create meaning in a media product you've studied. If you break the question down, it makes it much easier. So you've got common themes in certain genres and create meaning is the effect that it has on the audience. Media product you've studied is think about what we actually looked at in class. So for genre, we looked at the film Halloween. Now, obviously in these videos, I haven't got time to start embedding Halloween clips, but what you've got to do is do your own little bit of research into it. So let's analyze the genre conventions and how they can create meaning in a product. If we look at Halloween, you can go away and look at all the clips you want on YouTube and basically just kind of refresh your memory a little bit. But you look at the conventions first of all. So this is kind of like a structure of how you could answer it. Everyone's got their own little techniques, but I quite like to kind of write everything down, write all my evidence first, and then put the theories in to back up what I'm talking about. So for example, you could talk about three conventions. So let's talk about the dark lighting, which is a genre convention of a horror film. You could say the meaning that it has on the audience. So what is the effect? It makes the audience scared because they're a bit afraid of what they can't see. You could think about the eerie or spooky music. Now that adds suspense and atmosphere. And you could think about, excuse me, weapons like knives, which are more violent and scary than guns. Then what you could do is talk about the theories to back up what you're talking about. So Rick Altman, audience pleasures theory. This is to back up what you're talking about with all your conventions. So you could say that Halloween is a horror film due to the conventions that you've just talked about. And the reason why they are in there is because Rick Altman said that people want to watch for the visceral gut pleasure. Then you could talk about Steve Neal's theory and say that repetition is all of the conventions that are in there that have already been mentioned. And the difference is that people, um, the whole perspective of the movie is told from a different kind of viewpoint, different perspective. Here's a little example of what a good one might look like. It's not, not perfect by any means, but it just shows you a decent little structure. Now this has actually gone for the alternating structure where you make your statement and then put a theory to back it up, make a statement, put a theory to back it up. So it's a slightly different order than what was on the slide before. So you start off by saying something to do with what the question is. So in this particular case, it was um, about genre convention. So I've just said what a genre convention is straight away. Then I've given an example and then a specific example from a film Halloween and basically said what the effect is. Then I've put the theory in about Rick Altman, audience pleasures, and said how that applies to this particular film. 
Then I've repeated myself again and picked a different convention and given a particular example and what the effect is and then use the Steve Neal theory and try to add it in. Now we'll move on to the theories of representation. Representation is how different groups of people are portrayed in the media. And what we're going to look at as part of this is stereotypes. And a stereotype, if you're not sure what that means, is when you have like a widely held view about a group of people. So example of stereotypes are things like Asians, often portrayed as martial arts experts and geeks. Uh, black people are often portrayed as criminals and gangsters. Women often portrayed as sex objects. Stereotypes for all different races, but not all races are victimised or discriminated against. And one way or reason behind that is that a lot of media is still controlled by white people. So when they do nowadays like start introducing more female directors and more directors from different ethnicities that should start to filter out but it's still widely dominated by white people so one of the theories we're going to look at is by walter lippman and he basically had a theory that suggested that all products need to have some sort of stereotypes in so that the audience can have a shared recognition of the people and ideas that are in that product. Another theory that you need to know is Laura Mulvey's objectification of women. This is sometimes called the male gaze theory. And the idea behind it is that she suggested that women are positioned so that they are objectified in a media text. So in other words, in a film or TV show, women are positioned to be objectified as sex objects. And the male gaze theory name comes from the idea that the camera and the way that the film is shot is to show it through men's eyes and sexualize those women. So in lesson, we looked at our example product, which was grown ups. And one way of doing this is applying those two theories that we've just talked about to this particular product. So even on the front cover or the poster for the film, you can see what they're trying to represent. The men at the top are kind of all immature, having fun, and the women at the bottom, just their body language with the raised eyebrows, the arms crossed, that kind of thing, are kind of suggesting that they are a little bit more uptight. So the different things that we looked at for representation was the male immaturity, the representation of middle-aged women, and also we looked at some of the teenage boys' behaviour and the objectification of women and the male sleaze. So I'd advise you to go back and watch these clips if you can't remember. But essentially the water park scene uh, where they are all wearing t-shirts suggests that stereotypically men are at that age a little bit more kind of <coughs> conscious of their body and got more dad bod kind of figure so they wear t-shirts in the water park. You also see them acting very immaturely and trying to relive their childhood, which is a stereotypical middle-aged man. Middle-aged women are the kind of shown to be sat on the chairs, sun lounges, not really interested, not really having kind of any sort of that immature fun. They're a bit more boring, a little bit more reserved. It also shows the two teenage boys or two young boys anyway, being very kind of sleazy towards some of the women and very immature and playing pranks on people. Also shows some objectification of women where the lady is trying to fix her car and she's got no idea about cars, so that's a stereotypical thing about women. And then the men are all objectifying her by basically looking at her while she's trying to fix it. The key to this particular question and just this learning outcome in general is it's pretty much always gonna be in your 12 mark questions. And they are always analyze, analyze, analyze. So what you've got to do is read through the question carefully and pick out the keywords that are in there. And then try and link it up to what you've done in class. It always says in a media product you have studied, in a media product you've studied. So if you just remember the media products and the things that we've talked about in class, it should make it a lot easier. But if you look at this, these two as an example, so analyze how mise-en-scene elements. We talked about that earlier on in this video. 
it's essentially all of the things that you see on the screen. Then how have they contributed to construction of stereotypes? So you're looking for linking together mise-en-scene elements and how they could be seen in a stereotypical way. So the best thing to look for for this would be costumes and props. Think about costumes that are in there, think about props, and that will help to reinforce a stereotype. So in this particular case, you could talk about Walter Lippmann's theory, you could talk about grown-ups, you could also talk about uh, objectification of women as well, and Laura Mulvey, and put their grown-ups scene in as well. You need to put exa uh, real examples from that movie to make it make sense. The bottom one is analyze the concepts of genre and representation. So again, you could put in some genre theory, you can put in some representation theories and put some examples in. The thing with this one is it says in a media product you've studied, so you'd have to try and pick one, one product and do that for both. In other words, we've done representation, grown-ups, we've done genre, Halloween, you'd have to pick either Halloween or grown-ups and do both theories for them. So a little kind of planned out structured answer, which does you no harm in the exam to do, to just plan it out before you start writing it. Obviously, if you're stuck for time, then I wouldn't advise it, but it just helps you to kind of structure your answer properly. So first of all, you could talk about the theories. You could just get your theories out there. Talk about Walter Lippmann's stereotypes, talk about Laura Mulvey's male gaze. Then what you could do is apply those theories into practice with the actual movie itself so mise-en-scene elements you've got props costumes locations they are all things that you see on the screen and you could relate them to stereotypes so the locations stereotypical american family holiday um, and the males in the water park you've got the costumes you've got middle-aged men wearing t-shirts women in bikinis and they're objectified you've got the props you've got a broken down car contributes to the stereotype of women not knowing how to fix cars all of that information, you put that into your answer and you're going to get a really good mark. Here's an example of a pretty straightforward, achievable answer for you. So again, introduction paragraph is pick something out of the question and explain what it is. Then we start by giving our examples or you can put your theories in, it's up to you. So in this particular case, I've picked out the examples. So mention the product that you're studying mention some of the specific mise-en-scene elements and how they contribute to stereotype. Then what you could do is add in your theories. So Walter Lippmann says why, why we need these theories in the first place. And you could also put the Laura Movie's objectification in there as well. Right, finally the narrative theories. So we need to know two different narrative theories. So let's start taking a look at them. First one, Shvetan Todorov, 1969, came up with this theory called the five-step narrative formula. Now, essentially, most films, I think he basically said all films, but obviously we know that that's changed over time, that they follow this particular pattern. So there's five steps. Each story begins with everything normal. There is a disruption of this normality. Then they realize that something's happened. There's a recognised attempt to try and repair that damage. And then a return to the normal state with a change in the characters in some way. So the five stages have got names. Equilibrium, disruption, realisation, repair and new equilibrium. Obviously we know that this is a little bit oversimplified because not every movie follows this pattern. However, it is quite useful because it helps when you're planning a movie out makes you think about how you could film it and what kind of order you need to put things together and helps you think about continuity when you're doing planning and pre-production. Another narrative theory is by Claude Levi-Strauss, 1958. He came up with this theory called binary opposition and he believed that one of the most common ways of structuring a story is through the binary opposition of the characters. This could be in the mise-en-scene elements and in the narrative as well. So the majority of narratives from books and film have opposing main characters. The binary opposites make, t make the plot a little bit thicker and help to further the narrative. They also introduce contrast into the story. So some examples of binary opposition. In a superhero film, it's often good versus evil. 
In a horror or fantasy film, it's often su human versus supernatural. And in a comedy, this is often young versus old. As you can see here, some specific examples. You've got Man of Steel versus General Zod, Harry Potter versus Voldemort, and Kevin from Home Alone versus the Wet Bandits. So the main purpose behind binary opposition, I personally think that every film kind of needs some sort of bad guy in it, because without that, the narrative just feels a little bit boring. It's important to think about how you can convey the protagonist and who is the antagonist. What kind of things does it make clear so you know who the good guy is? What sort of things are in there? What mise-en-scene elements? Think about location, props and costumes. Think about the lighting that they use on certain characters. Think about all that kind of stuff and the behaviour. Look for encoded messages in the text. So, for, for example, maybe wearing a cross around the neck. Maybe wearing light-coloured clothing or having bright lighting when it's on them. One particular film that we can apply this to is Die Hard. So obviously Die Hard is getting on a little bit now and it's quite an old film, but it's still absolutely brilliant, so it's worth watching. And you can apply both of these theories to it. You can also do it to many, many, many films. You, you can pick out binary opposition in almost everything. And most films tend to follow the five-step narrative as well. So the five-step narrative applied to a particular product I've slightly adjusted the repair stage to attempt to repair because it makes it nice and easy for us to remember this little term called EDRAN. EDRAN is the five steps, equilibrium, disruption, recognition, attempt to repair, new equilibrium. And we can apply this to many, many films, but in Die Hard, what happens is he comes home to his family and everything's normal, everything's calm. That's the equilibrium. Then some terrorists take over the Nakatomi building, which he's in the Christmas party. So obviously that is the disruption to normality. Then you've got two points of recognition in this particular film, but either one is fine. Basically, he isn't in the room when the terrorists storm in, so he realises what's happening and kind of escapes. Also, on the outside of the building, people realise that there's a disruption when the policeman's car is shot off from the building. The fourth step is when the police try sending in a SWAT team and John McClane is trying to solve it himself. The new equilibrium is restored when the police get McClane, his wife, and the other hostages out the building, and the McLeans leave in a police car at the end. We can also talk about binary opposition in Die Hard, because there's two kind of clear, distinct characters. John McClane is the protagonist. He wears casual clothes, he's a policeman, he's a typical American of the time, he's wisecracking. You can tell that he's the good guy. Hans Gruber is the main antagonist. He wears a smart, dark suit. He wear, He's a terrorist. He's got a German accent, which obviously in the 80s, there was still quite a lot of kind of hatred towards Germany after the war. And he's very arrogant in his behavior. So that's two clear characters on both sides it makes binary opposition. I personally think this is the easiest theories that you can apply and the easiest to write out an answer. If you're asked to analyse how the concept of narrative can be applied to a product you've studied, you just need to think about a film and start applying the two different theories to it. So you could say, introduction, what narrative is. Then you could say, one theory is by Todorov and say the five steps and apply them to the film. Another theory is by Levi Strauss and then explain how that applies to that film as well.